morning, everyone. Um, welcome to our second webinar in our series um, with Kakna 1A Foundation, um, which is led by Teresa Spong, who you'll meet in just a second. But today, you know, we had our first webinar in the series was on hypotonia, which was an incredible overview of what hypotonia is, why it happens, how it affects the systems of the body, um, some tools for um, kind of working through hypotonia and getting stronger. That is up on our website. I will put the link in the chat. So if you miss that one, you can go back and check it out. Today, we'll be talking about unraveling the mysteries of ataxia, hypertonicity, athetosis, and mixed tone. So, you know, um, we'll be really digging in to see some of these other movement issues. Um, I'm going to do some quick housekeeping, which is, if you don't know me, I'm Gabi Konofker. I am um, co-founder of Deep Connections and um, mom to um, a nine-year-old who's got a severe DEE. So I'm really thrilled to see people coming in, some uh, new names, some familiar names. Um, so we're really glad to see you today. Please note that all participants will be off camera um, and muted, but if you do have questions, we really encourage you to put them into the chat or the Q&A as they come to you and we will get to them. Um, towards the end, we'll save time for questions. Um, and please go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat. We'd love to hear where you're coming from, what, um, what your child struggles with. Tell us a little bit about what brought you here today. Um, and we'll look forward to chatting with you guys towards the end of the webinar. For now, I'm gonna pass it over to Sunita, um, who is going to introduce our speaker today. Sunita, so glad that you're here with us today. Thank you so much, Gabi, and we're excited to be doing this uh, series with you all. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Sunita Malapati. I'm with a vice president of the Kakna 1A Foundation, and I'm really excited to be introducing Teresa Spong. She uh, was the presenter at our first webinar in this series, and so for those of you who weren't able to join us for that or watch the recording, I wanted to just briefly introduce her today. Teresa Spong has over 35 years of experience as a physical therapist. And she specializes in the field of pediatrics in the early intervention and school arenas, as well as in private outpatient pediatric physical therapy. In addition to her bachelor's degree in physical therapy, she holds a master's degree in early childhood special education from the University of Texas in Austin. And she's been an instructor there specializing in training for teachers working with children with disabilities. As we mentioned the promotions for this webinar, we are extremely grateful to have her as part of the CACNA 1A community as a grandmother to one of our sweet CACNA 1A champions. As you will see, she has a deep passion for this work and we're really looking forward to today's presentation. Thank you, Teresa, for being here with us. Thank you, Sunita. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen here and we'll get started. I'm so happy that all of you guys were able to join us again and welcome to the new people that joined us. I'm hoping a lot of you were able to watch the first webinar on the recording because this, and it, this training is really going to build on what we talked about last time. And um, I promise <laughs> not to go over time um, as much as I did last time. Um, but I always have a lot to say. And um, I try and figure out what is going to be the most impactful for you and um, the most um, hit the middle ground for parents and professionals that might be joining us. Um, so I did want to say as a disclaimer that a lot of what I talk about is my opinion and based on my experience. So you may have physical therapists or occupational therapists or speech therapists that you work with with your child, and they may have differing opinions. And that's okay. We are a pretty diverse community of providers. Um, so I kind of wanted to overview what we're going to talk about today. We are hopefully going to gain a better understanding of ataxia and hypertonicity and athetosis and all those dystonia, dyskinesia words, right? And how therapists and doctors, we kind of use them interchangeably and they sound really mysterious. So I'm hoping that with some videos and pictures of some of my kids will demystify some of that for you. And um, we'll talk about some strategies. And we're going to build on some of the strategies that we talked about last time. I'm going to touch on therapy and funding a bit and also recreational activities. And these were some things that when um, 
I was first talking with Lisa and Sunitha about developing this series they wanted me to kind of address for families because I think there's maybe a little bit of a misunderstanding about um, what ECI is and, and how funding and things might work. So that's what we're going to cover in the next 45 minutes to 60 minutes. So we're going to start with ataxia. And I know because CACNA 1A is co-sponsoring this webinar, most of our population of kids, including my granddaughter, um, have ataxia. And so ataxia just means without coordination. It, it, that's it. It's pretty simple. So they um, often appear um, very clumsy, klutzy. They fall a lot. Um, they have poor control of trunk, arms, and legs. Um, our kids and adults lack um, that balance, right? That balance to really maintain and stabilize. Um, you will often see it expressed also in their fine motor tasks. So I'm just going to remind you a little bit about everything that is a fine motor task, right? So besides what we first notice in kids with ataxia is generally they're walking. They walk very clumsily, kind of like a puppet. We're gonna look at some videos of what that looks like. Um, they can have poor coordination of their hands, their fingers. You may notice like slurring in their speech and language, like certain sounds may be difficult for them to make. Again, remember, this is a coordination of a movement and our tongue is a muscle and our lips are a muscle and our cheeks are a muscle. So it can affect how we eat, how we swallow. It can Im impact handwriting. Um, it can impact our vision because our eyes are controlled by muscles. So think everything is controlled by a muscle of some sort. And if you have this lack of coordination that's occurring, then you can have, um, implications in all aspects of development. So in some of the literature, I also found that mood and cognition can be impacted. That's not necessarily something I've seen, but it was in the literature, so I decided to share it. Um, etiology. So in the CACNA 1A population, right, of people, we often hear about cerebellar ataxia, right? So I wanted everybody to know where their cerebellum is. So that's this little part of the brain that kind of sits at the base of the skull here. Um, so just a visual for you where that occurs. So um, in our DEE group, right, they have a wide variety of etiologies. And so they're can also exist ataxia and other genetic disorders. It's not particular to CACNA 1A. Um, so cerebellar ataxia, spinal cerebellar ataxia, episodic ataxia, these are all terms we hear in um, the CACNA 1A group. But I want you to think about, besides the cerebellum, there are other parts of the brain that also do coordination. Right, so our basal ganglia, our substantia nigra, which are more internal parts of our brain, um, also help with coordination of fine motor movements and speech and language and swallow and chewing and all of those kinds of things. So we've got several parts of the brain that help with coordination. Um, what I notice um, a lot in children with ataxia is that their vestibular system, and remember we talked about that last time, our balance system, it's our inner ear, right? That balance system seems to also be implicated as well as their proprioceptive system. And remember those handouts that I had last time on proprioception, things you can do um, to improve proprioception. But I just want to remind you, for those of you who didn't watch the first webinar, um, that proprioception is our sense that tells us where we are in place and space. So these are in our joint receptors, right? And they tell us where we are and where we're starting our movement from. So if our vestibular system and our proprioceptive system aren't working great for us, and then we have this lack of coordination, it can be very challenging to get up and move against gravity. Um, one of the things that I noticed um, with my ataxic kids is they often complain that they're a little bit dizzy, they can have nausea, vomiting, vertigo. Those are all things that can be associated with ataxia. Um, most of my kids have underlying hypotonia. Like if they're ataxic, they generally have a low tone trunk and a, a low tone underlying 
base, which is why we started with hypotonia, because it's the base of, of most of these movement disorders. Their vision systems can be impacted as well. And um, remember, vision, vestibular system, and proprioception are critical to movement. So this is why in PT world, we talk about these things because they all have to work together for us to get up and move and for us to balance and for us to stay upright against gravity. So I wanna kind of show you a little video. This is my granddaughter, Louise, when she was learning to walk. Um, we were really encouraging her to walk a lot. What I want you to notice is how she keeps her arms up in high guard that she keeps this very wide base of support in her legs and that um, she gets faster and faster kind of as she walks so um, and she falls an awful lot this is what we i fondly call the band-aid age we're covered in bumps and bruises and everybody's gonna go oh she almost hit her head right that's the other thing that happens we get lots of oopsies but that's pretty typical of how ataxic kids walk. They, they weave from side to side. They have this uncoordinated kind of movement patterns, more jerky, not smooth. Um, one of the things you should note is that there's often times of the day where their ataxia can be better or worse. So what I've noticed in my practice is that um, my parents will tell me, often first thing in the morning, they're very uncoordinated getting out of bed. It's almost like they got to get their, their land legs under them, right? Um, they can also be worse in the day whenever it's close to nap time or they're tired or fatigued. They've been at school all day and they come home and they're really fatigued from their day. Um, also when they're sick, you will notice that ataxia frequently gets worse with illness. So we're going to move on. So we're, we're looking at working on our vestibular system again, right? So we're going back to our therapy balls. We're bouncing. Balancing activities become really a critical part of what you want to implement with kids um, that have ataxia. So um, like sometimes I get big blocks of foam or you can do this on like a mattress or something, right? That's soft that they land on. And I just want them to stand and stand still, like really be able to balance. They have a hard time stopping movement. It's like um, once they get going, it just gets faster and faster and faster until they crash somewhere until they learn to slow down and stop. So often the hardest things for them to learn is to move backwards or to balance just in static standing. We do a lot of work on the proprioceptive system. We know this is a real weak area for them. So I gave you lots of handouts last time about things to work on the proprioceptive system, but I wanna kind of add to that today. So one of the things we sometimes use, OTs love um, weighted vests and compression vests. These can often give our body a sense of where we are in place in space. Um, if it's something you're interested in, talk to your therapist often like I said, it's the occupational therapists that really um, do a lot of this sensory work. So deep pressure activities, massage, all of those kinds of things can really be impactful. Working their vision system can be really important. And I encourage those of you who have access to your visually impaired teachers to tag into them. The sixth um, webinar that we're going to do, you are going to have access to one of my favorite VI teachers, and she has some great strategies for working with visual systems and motor systems together. And that's a very critical piece of getting their eyes and their body to work together. We definitely want to implore all of our hypotonia strategies that we talked about last time, because remember, they have, still have this low tone underlying base. Um, Motor planning and motor coordination become a little more important for these kids. So I love to crawl with them, even if they're nine, 10 years old. I mean, some kids don't think that's real cool when they're nine or 10, but we do lots of crawling, belly scooting, climbing stairs, climbing on and off of things. We create obstacle courses, balance activities. We do lots of kicking and throwing. We do lots of eye hand, eye foot coordination. Um, and I don't know if Brain Gym is something that many of you might be familiar with, but there's a lovely book out there. Um, 
Brain Gym's been around for a long time and you can buy these on Amazon and they've got pictures and explanations. So it's not rocket science, right? You don't have to be a teacher to do Brain Gym, but Brain Gym really works on eye hand, eye foot, crossing midline, all of those kind of strategies that really help us with our coordination. So that's just a nice resource for you guys um, if you happen to be interested or think you have a child that might um, benefit from those kind of activities. And of course, we wanna work on our fine motor skills and I'm gonna leave that to the occupational therapist to elaborate a little bit more on how you work on coordination with fine motor skills. Um, hypertonicity, okay, so we've been talking about hypotonicity, too little tone, right? And now we're going to talk about hyper, that means too much. So these kids have too much muscle tone. Their brain is really informing them, their muscles to fire, fire, fire too much. And we see this a lot in our kids, like in the DEE group, like um, kids who have seizures, kids who've had brain damage you really see that hypertonicity and you may see it when they're having seizures more than in their day-to-day -day life, right? But basically it just means they have too much tension in their muscles and their muscles can be abnormally rigid and it can really hamper proper movement. So sometimes therapists like to confuse you and say, oh, spasticity, or some therapists call it dystonia, right? Um, all of these words are just sort of interchangeable, but what I want you to understand is these kids often have limitations in their range of motion, whereas our really hypotonic kids, they have over range of motion, right? That hyperflexibility from their loose ligaments. These kids have the opposite problem. They don't move through their full range of motion necessarily. So they tend to move in reflexive patterns. And so I put all those patterns kind of on this screen. These terms don't mean a lot to you, but I have some pictures and we're gonna talk through like what that looks like. So they tend to scissor their little legs and cross their legs and point their toes. And they tend to flex up their little hands or they really extend their little arms um, into um, what we call reflexive patterns. So I'm gonna introduce you to yet another one of my babies. This baby is new to me as of January. He, start, he is going to be starting school in the school district I work in. He is three years old. He's newly diagnosed with spasticity and hypertonia. And so I'm just going to play this video so you can kind of see what that looks like. He doesn't have any braces on, so he's always on his tiptoes. You'll notice like his trunk here, how stiff it is. And Miss Lori's having to help him bend over to kind of reach for things. But you notice he still stays on those tiptoes all of the time. We're gonna watch him what he looks like on the floor. So he actually has all four extremities have spasticity in them. But when he's on the floor, he moves better actually. His left side moves way better than his right side. He tends to not use his right side very much. And we're gonna go on to what he looks like in sitting. So he's actually leaning against this. He can't sit um, very well by himself. He still has that very rounded posture that we talked about, remember, when we talked about hypotonia, how they really see sit and sit back in their pelvis. He actually has a very hypotonic trunk. Um, so he has to lean against something to really be able to use his hands. If he doesn't use his hands, he can put his hands down and he can sit by himself. Um, we're we're going to talk more about adaptive equipment um, in our next webinar, but I just kind of wanted to show you what he looked like this day. He was coming in. We were kind of doing some trial and error with equipment with him just to see what he might need for the classroom that he could function in, right? This is what I really want to show you about his movement patterns. So children with spasticity have a lot of tightness right here in these adductor muscles. So they tend to scissor their legs, they point their toes. You notice how he's stiff, stiff, stiff. His whole body has to work. Now he has never been in a walker before. This is his first time in a walker. So I'm like cheering madly because he looks amazing. He definitely needs some braces. But that is a pretty typical little scissory pattern for kids who have hypertonicity. This would be fatiguing for him to do right now. He, he absolutely 
isn't going to get around this way in his world, right? Um, so we put it. So we put him in a gate trainer just to see what he could do. And he indeed can move around quite well in his little gate trainer. And having that little pommel in the middle really helped with some of that scissoring. So what do we do with these kids? So um, one, I use a lot of adaptive equipment, but there are also some medical treatments for hypertonicity. And I'm just, I'm not a doctor, so I'm not like making recommendations. These are just things that you should be aware of and you can talk to your neurologist about um, in your area. So a lot of times kids with hypertonicity will benefit from oral baclofen. So that is a medication that they take orally. And um, for kids who are much tighter than Caleb, um, this can be a really useful medication because it keeps their muscle tone from just dominating their whole body. Um, the problem, of course, with an oral medication is that it impacts all your muscles. It just doesn't selectively go, oh, well, my hamstrings are tight, so I'm just going to go there, right? Um, so um, oral medications are a little bit um, more challenging because they can make kids sleepy or they can impact other aspects of their cognition because it makes them a little more lethargic. Um, baclofen pumps are a pump that they actually surgically put in and then um, the medication goes straight to the spinal cord and that's um, one of the treatments that we see sometimes for kids with hypertonicity. One of my favorites and one which I'm recommending for Caleb is Botox injections. So Botox injections are not just for wrinkles. Um, <laughs> we, we use it in, um, <coughs> excuse me. We use it to treat hypertonicity. And the thing I love about Botox is we can target specific muscle groups. So in Caleb's case, his heel cords, those muscles that make him stand on his tiptoes, his hamstrings, and his adductors are really tight. So we can target those muscles with injections. And what it does is it helps relax. Um, those muscles for them and allows us in therapy world and parent world to really work on them gaining some better skills. So this is a kid, remember last time I said, I'm not real fond of um, bracing kids if I don't have to. Caleb's a kid who we are gonna brace because he's on his tiptoes all the time and he can't get flat footed. And that tiptoe position is going to really impact him. Um, there are some surgical options as well, um, dorsal root rhizotomies, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about them, but um, they require extensive one-year rehab post-surgery. They are a huge commitment for parents and, and kids, and you've got to have a lot of therapy in place in order to successfully um, come out of that rhizotomy with better function. Tendon lengthenings are often um, done for kids with hypertonicity, especially in the ankles. And what the surgeon does, he's go in and he lengthens that tendon when they get contractures. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that when we talk about skeletal deformities a little bit later on. Um, these kids often have hypotonia as their underlying tone problem. And for them, we do lots of massage, stretching, range of motion, myofascial release, if you have therapists that do myofascial release, because gaining movement is our priority often with these kids. They have restricted movement. So instead of having too much movement, like hypotonic kids do, they have too little movement. We still need to work on our core, our trunk, and our pelvis. So we still do a lot of therapy ball work and a lot of balance work, vestibular work, proprioceptive work. They have the same kind of issues as other kids with tone problems. Um, so apoptosis is probably the one that most people don't hear a lot about. Um, these kids are rare. Um, so they show up in the rare Gen X um, community a lot. Um, these kids have slow, uncoordinated, involuntary kind of writhing movements. So they kind of move in these circular patterns. Um, it impacts everything. 
fingers, head, hands, arms, legs, neck. They often don't have head control. They have difficulty feeding. They have this hypotonic underlying base. And these kids are often called dystonic as well. So again, you can see how the terminology can be a little bit confusing. These kids are really hard to treat as a therapist. These are the kids who I come out black and blue because they swing their arms around and they're whoosh, right? They take, they knock me off the bolster, whatever we're working on. Their challenge is they have con trouble controlling their movement patterns. They've got all this movement, but they can't control it. So positioning for these guys is key. And we're going to talk about that um, in our next webinar a lot, why positioning is important and why um, stable instability is critical um, for a lot of kids. So this is Connor and you are going to see a lot of Connor in my next webinar because he is going to be a case study for us. Um, but this is what Connor looks like. Connor does have um, athetosis. He has a very low trunk, does not have head control or trunk control, any of those controls, right? This is what he can do on his tummy. He's two and a half in these videos. He's now five. So I'll have some updates for you. But I want you to notice the randomness of how he moves his arm and how he moves his legs, right? He's very reflexive in his movement patterns. He's a sweet baby. So, so happy all the time. God love him. Um, but doesn't have a lot of control of any of his movement patterns. You'll also notice he has an up gaze, um, which I did not know at the time I was initially treating him what that was. But since my lovely granddaughter has come into our life, I have a much better understanding of that. So mixed tone just means they have ataxia and hypotonia, right? They've got some mixed tone patterns. And what you will notice with kids with seizures and seizure disorders, if they have myoclonic seizures or myotonic seizures or all of those muscle movement type seizures, you may notice a mix of any of these as a part of who they are. So I just wanted to kind of give you a, an idea what that might look like. Um, and those of you who have children in your home, and I assume most of you on this call do, you see these things on a daily basis. So one of the problems that kids with um, all these different muscle tones have is they can develop skeletal deformities over time. So the most common being hip dislocation, scoliosis, kyphosis, those are very, very common. And I wanted to just take a little time to set up what we're going to talk about next time with positioning and why standing is so critical. It's very easy for our babies to develop hip problems and hip dysplasia because they aren't weight bearing early, early on. Many of our kids aren't. Um, you're going to see when we talk about um, positioning that if possible, I get my baby standing as early as I possibly can for this very reason. We can do a lot with good positioning to prevent deformities from occurring. Scoliosis is just a curvature of the spine, right? So like an S. Um, kyphosis is more a curvature of the spine forward. So you see kyphosis more in hypotonic kids because they tend to round forward. Um, you will often see contractures. Therapists talk about contractures all the time. So Caleb, the little boy that was standing on his tiptoes, he actually didn't have AFOs. And he is on the border of being too tight to be able to get flat in an AFO. And had he been just a little bit tighter, we may have had to talk about some surgical interventions for him. Our, their hamstrings also get very tight. So I just want to kind of show you why that happens. So these kids sit a lot or they're in wheelchairs a lot. And so our hamstrings cross our knee joint and they cross our hip joint. So if we're always sitting, our hamstrings are in a short position. And these kids don't long leg sit very well, right? And once these hamstrings back here get tight, what happens is it starts pulling our pelvis. So it pulls our pelvis into a little C and pulls it forward. And so it gets hard to sit square on their bottom, which is where we should be sitting, right? We should sit square on our bottom. 
So hamstring tightness and hamstring shortening can be a real problem and can also lead to hip dislocations, which is why therapists are so like, oh my gosh, we have to maintain the range of motion. We have to maintain that movement within the joint so that we don't develop these secondary problems of contractures and skeletal deformities. If kids get a significant enough scoliosis or a significant enough hip dysplasia, surgical interventions could be an option for them. And we're not really gonna cover them because that's not what we're really here to talk about today. So I wanted to speak a little bit to, to the different kinds of intervention and the different kinds of therapies that exist and hopefully clarify a little bit for you about the approach that maybe your child is in. So if you have a baby who's in birth to three and you live in the United States, you are able to tag into early intervention programs, right? They exist in all 50 states. It is a federally mandated program. Every state chooses to use their funds differently. So that is why services from state to state can look very, very different. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about, I live in Texas, so that's the program I'm most familiar with, but many of the states like Texas employ the same model. Um, we are contracted out um, to third-party providers, right? So um, I happen to work for an education service center. I worked for Easter Seals, right? So different agencies bid and contract. In Texas, we're divided by counties, and in the cities, we're divided by zip codes. So your state may be very different because you may live in Rhode Island, and it's the size of not even San Antonio, right? And so um, your how your state flows early childhood intervention services to you can look very different. In ECI though, what I love about ECI, besides I get babies first and there's this neuroplasticity of the brain and we can really make so much progress in the first three years, is I get to work with the parents. You are my partner in this process. I am there to teach and help you every step of the way. And I am in your home. In Texas, we go in homes and um, COVID stopped that for a little bit in Texas, but we've been back out in the homes for a year and a half now. So we are flowing services in person um, and we use what we call a coaching model. So that's not a rehab model, that's a little bit more of an educational model. So in that model, the idea is that I'm coming in and I'm training you, and then I'm gonna give you some homework. And I'm gonna ask you to do two or three things this week. And we're gonna try and embed those things in your daily routines. I don't want it to be that you have to carve out another hour out of your day to just do therapy. I want it to be something that you can incorporate into bath time or, our feeding time, or this is how we're, we're gonna do our stander while we're doing our tube feeding, right? We are going to try and incorporate as much as we can into our process. Now, I know some people get a little frustrated with coaching model because they really just want someone to come and like work with their kid and, and, and then, you know, it's all done. But in fact, Therapy only works if we're doing this over and over and over and over again. Research shows that children learn tasks by doing it over and over and over and over again. If I just show them how to do something once a week for an hour, they're not going to make a lot of progress. So it's really important that the parents have a buy-in with me um, in ECI. So that's what we call a coaching model. So that what that might look like for me is I come in and um, I might bring a therapy ball with me or something with me, and I'm going to show you how to do it. I'm going to encourage you to take video. I really encourage families to videotape what I'm doing. I don't care. Um, but that way, when I go away and they go, oh, my gosh, where were her hands? I didn't remember exactly how she did that, right? They've got little videos, and we all have phones now, so we need to use the tech we have to our advantage. Um, so that's kind of what ECI looks like. When ECI is over, right, at three, we sort of boot you out the door, sadly. Um, and if you are, if your child is eligible for school-based services, they may go into a three to five-year-old program. 
and they keep changing the letters, but it used to be PPCD, but now it's something else. Um, but basically it's not pre-K, it is a three to five year old program that is designed to help kids catch up or make as much progress as possible so that by the time they're five and ready for kindergarten, we hope they're closer to readiness for um, kindergarten. So school-based therapy is very different from other kinds of therapy, right? So it is an educational model. It's not a medical model. It's not a rehab model. It's not even a coaching model. So there's good and bad things about all, all things. Um, in school, PT and OT are a related service, right? So it has to be related to a child's IEP. It has to be related to their ability to learn and be educated. And that's something that I think a lot of people don't understand is that I work in the schools and there are kids, yes, if I tested them on a developmental test, they would be a bit behind, but they're walking, they're getting in and out of their desk by themselves. They're playing on the playground by themselves. They go to the bathroom by themselves, even though maybe they can't do hopscotch or they can't do X, Y, or Z, it doesn't make them eligible for a related service in a school environment because there's no barrier to their education. So my role in a school is to bridge what any kind of motor problems would cause for them to be able to learn. And I hope that makes sense to people. So oftentimes school-based therapy occurs on a consultant model, not a direct model. And um, one of the reasons I work in rural Texas is because I manage my caseload very well and I see most of the kids that, that um, need therapy. We actually put hands on. There are some kids on consult. They're usually in junior high and high school and they don't wanna see therapists anymore. They're like, it's not cool for the therapist to come see me anymore. So um, we'll go in and make sure that there are no barriers to their school day, that they can move from class to class or desk to desk. Or if they're in a life skills class, they're often, their aides and teachers are well-trained by us um, so that they all are doing their positioning and handling the correct way throughout their day. The thing that is really sad for me about school-based therapy is I often don't see the parents except at an art meeting. And I know that's a major complaint for a lot of parents. Um, I'm a little bit different, Lori and I, um, Lori's the PT assistant that works with me. We invite our parents to come up and observe therapy sessions. We let them know when we're gonna be there, when we're gonna be working with their kids. If they wanna come and observe, I'm happy. I love it. I want to know what's going on in their home. I want to mirror the equipment that's in their home with what's in their classroom so that it's familiar to the kids. We have a really good parent interaction, but I know that varies a lot from therapist to therapist. I will also say in the big school districts like Austin and Houston and Dallas, big cities, the therapists are often carrying caseloads of 150 to 200 kids. So they don't have the option to necessarily lay hands on these kids very often. So that brings us to private therapy. So in private therapy world, that is rehab, right? That is, you're going somewhere, we're gonna do therapy and you can get therapy sometimes one, two, three times a week, depending on your funding source. Your funding source, dictates absolutely what we're able to do in private therapy world. And I worked in a private clinic and I would be very frustrated with um, the limitations that they would put on me um, to being able to do um, therapy and frequency and things like that. There's an upside and a downside to private therapy. Often in private therapy, especially with COVID going on, the parents don't get to go back with the kids. The therapist comes out, they take the kids, they go back, they do magic therapy. They come back, they bring the kids. They may tell you, you know, in five minutes, this is what we worked on. These are some things you can do at home. Um, so I know COVID is really limited. Um, in the clinic I worked in um, that Mandy owns, and y'all are gonna get to meet Mandy. She's gonna do your language training um, in a few months. Um, they have some one-way um, glass, so the parents can be behind the glass and still observe the therapy session, and that's kind of a nice feature, but not all private therapy places have that. 
Here's the problem in private therapy world is once a kid quits making progress, funding says we're no longer going to fund this. So whether it's insurance or whether it's Medicaid, often when kids plateau, they cut off their therapy. And that, that's true in adult world too. That's true, that's true in every aspect of physical therapy world, not just chronically ch disabled children, right? This is true of everybody. Rehab is, the implication is you're making progress. And as long as you're making progress and you're setting goals where you can make progress, then that funding source will often continue to fund those activities. So take home message is, you know, you're often as parents battling insurance and Medicaid. Me as a therapist, I'm often battling insurance and Medicaid. It's what I love about ECI and school is I don't have to deal with third party funding sources. If if a child needs therapy in ECI, I can do that. If a child needs therapy in school, I can do that. Um, so you can tell I don't have a, a real love for um, insurance and Medicaid and all the billing aspects of the job that I do. It's a necessary, it's a necessary part of my world, but um, I spend a lot of time writing letters of appeal. Um, so one of the things that Sunitha and Lisa had asked me about was um, treatment intensives. So those are fairly new in um, the therapy world. So I would say in the last three to four years, these have become prominent. And I do happen to know a little bit about them because we have a Napa location in Austin. So I'm just going to briefly explain a little bit about what they do, but I go to their website if you have an interest in it and see. They're located in the big city. So Austin has one, I think like Denver, maybe LA. There's some on the East Coast too, maybe Chicago, Philadelphia. So there's some places and it's all on their website, like where they have locations. So these are three week intensives. The kids come in, they get PT, OT and speech, like six hours a day. They have this cool neuro suit they wear and, um, they, they, the idea is that, ooh, if we intensely do this therapy, then we can get kids making progress, right? And for certain kinds of kids, this works great, right? For certain kinds of kids. If you are a kid, though, that makes progress really, really slowly over slow, long periods of time, treatment intensives don't have the same bang for buck. Um, they can be cost prohibitive. Um, I have two families that do regular treatment intensives. They were in my, they were with me in ECI, and when they left ECI, they started doing treatment intensives. Um, it costs about seven thousand um, dollars for a three-week treatment intensive. Um, is what my family shared with me. It may be more than that now. Um, in Texas, Star Medicaid, which is the Medicaid that um, you get kind of through MDCP in Texas. Um, was starting to fund them on a very limited basis. So that might be something you in, you're interested in or want to investigate for your family. Um, we've talked about all of these things. I really want to get to recreational activities. So that whole big message about therapy is to say therapy doesn't last forever. And I start with my babies telling families that Therapy is not going to last forever. You are not going to have a therapist with you when you're 12 and 15 and 20 and 25, right? So what are some things that you can do as a lifetime activity that will benefit your tone issues? And you have to feature match, right? What you're interested in, what your child is interested in, and what things meet their needs as a person that moves a little differently. So I wanna talk about yoga first. So yoga is one of my favorite, favorite things to do. I often do it with my older kids. We're gonna go look at why yoga can be important. So we are blessed in our ECI program. We have a physical therapist who is certified in baby yoga. And so um, she does it on Zoom for our families that live far away. And so my daughter, my granddaughter, Louise, does baby yoga with her mom. It's a mommy and me class. So I'm just going to show you some short videos and I'm going to explain why 
this is a really a big asset to me as her physical therapist. So this is called baby bear in, um, in infant yoga. And why is baby bear an important skill? What is that gonna build for her? So she's bringing her feet up to her arms, right? And that is how babies at five and six months old, six months uh, developmentally, start to develop their lower abdominal muscles. That is the only way you develop your lower abdominal muscles, by the way. You don't develop your lower abdominal muscles by doing sit-ups. It doesn't even engage your lower core. So bringing your feet up to play is actually helping us develop her trunk, her stable base, getting that low tone under control. One of my, and I'm just going to show you a few examples. Um, so this is downward dog. So why is downward dog important? So this is what downward dog looks like. For those of you who are yogis, you know this. So in babies, what's the most important thing they have to be able to do when they fall down? They have to be able to get back up so that they can keep walking. And if I can't get back up, then what I'm going to have to do is crawl over someplace and pull back up to stand. So what I love about yoga for many, many reasons is it helps to maintain range of motion. So for those tight kids, a lot of these activities would really help with their flexibility. It builds core and stability. Um, for our kids with hypotonia, it showcases their flexibility. Like when I did yoga, you know, I'm pretty tight. So my flexibility was pretty limited. So I really wanted to do yoga for myself for gaining some flexibility and gaining some core and stable um, bases. Yoga by nature builds breathing in. And remember, we talked about how important breath is for language and speech and that our kids often just really shallowly breathe and they more pant breathe rather than really inhale all the way down and exhale all the way out. Yoga, if you've never done a yoga class, um, there is nothing easy about yoga. It builds your endurance. It improves your postural muscles. It improves your balance. There's lots of poses, like when you get older, tree pose and some of those that really focus on building balance. So for kids, with movement disorders, yoga can be a life, a lifetime exercise for them because there's yoga for everybody. And if you can't find it in your, say you live in rural parts of the world, like we have rural Texas, um, there's online videos for everything. So you can always find online things. What I love for my daughter and my granddaughter is they get to do this class together and it's fun and it's good for my daughter too because it helps reduce her stress. It helps her focus on her breathing and they have really enjoyed doing that together. Um, so that's what I'm gonna say about yoga. And now I wanna talk about dance. So um, adaptive dance has gotten more popular in the last few years. These photographs were actually taken in 1986 when I started my very first adaptive dance class, not knowing how to dance at all. Um, this young lady right here and this young lady here were some of the very first kids I worked with in my very first job. Amy and Amber are two of the loves of my life. Amy is now 47 years old. We are still friends. We still send each other Christmas cards and talk to each other on Facebook. Um, Amy loved, loved, loved to dance. Amy has apoptosis. She had no head control, no trunk control, no arm control, no leg control. She was also the very first child I ever met who had a power wheelchair and a communication device that she used with a little light pointer. Old technology, right? Like we're talking the 80s. Nowadays, we'd consider those dinosaurs, but she was the very first child who did any of those things. And she taught me so much. Well, her dream was to dance. So I was like, Amy, I just, I don't know how to dance. I don't know anything about dance. And she was coming into a clinic I was working in um, where I was also working with adults. So um, this young lady right here, Dee, walked out from behind the curtain. She was one of my neck patients and said, 
I'm a dance teacher and I'm going to go talk to my dance studio and see if we can't start a dance class um, there. So we started our first dance class ourselves, just Dee and I and Amy and Amber. And our very, this is our recital photo um, from 1986. Um, and we did a ballet. And so we had a great time. The next year we incorporated um, three more young ladies into our class. So we had five. We did a tap dance. We also added um, another young lady who was their age, wanted to volunteer and help us in the class because we had kids who couldn't stand or balance. Amber can't stand and balance by herself. Amy certainly could not stand by herself. So we needed extra hands. So this is just to say that if you can dream it, you can do it. it. It's really just about asking sometimes. In Austin, we are blessed. We have a program here called To Dream to Dance. I think they're now in four locations. They do dance classes for children with disabilities and the dance classes are free. They have to pay for their own costumes. And um, you can also Google their website and find out more about the young lady who started this um, program in the Austin area. And she somehow applied for grants and gets funding to help um, pay for the teachers so that the classes are free to the kids. And I know for the dads out in the audience, you're saying, gosh, but what if I have a little boy and I really don't want him to do yoga and I really don't want him to do dance because that's kind of girly. So Tai Chi, if those of you who are familiar with martial arts um, know much about Tai Chi, it's very much like yoga. It's very slow, controlled kind of movements. So Tai Chi is a very good option um, for um, martial arts, if, if that appeals to you. Hippotherapy, of course, is one of my favorite things. We start along about the time we started this dance class, we also started a hippotherapy program in the community I was living in. And the lady who um, really headed this up, this effort, is still running that program to this day. So horseback riding is wonderful for lots and lots of different reasons. Um, it, it's like sitting on a therapy ball, right? And it builds so much language and the kids get to be outdoors and they get to do something really cool like ride a horse. So there's lots and lots of hippotherapy programs now around the world. Um, swimming is probably one of my absolute favorite things to do with my kids. Um, in Texas, it's hot. So in the summer and probably six months out of the year, if you're outside, you want to be by water. So um, we do lots of aquatics. Um, there are aquatic therapy programs that you go to, and it's like getting therapy. But just because you're not doing aquatic therapy doesn't mean you can't swim um, or do swimming activities. So with my kids in the summer, I will often, if they have either a pool in their backyard or a neighborhood pool, I will often do a couple of sessions at the beginning of the summer to teach parents some things to do in the water with their kids. And I can tell you, I've made some great progress with kids doing things in the water versus on land. I had a little boy who walked for an entire year in a kiddie pool, round and round and round, could walk for an entire hour. And if I put him on land, he would not take one single solitary step. So, I mean, eventually he did, but we would go to the pool and walk round and round and round the pool and let him work on um, walking and balance in the water. And that's the beauty of the water. It really gives them a little bit of buoyancy and it helps them feel a little more stable. So kids will often do things in the water that they won't do on dry land. So I want to talk a little bit about bike riding because, you know, we are in Austin too and Live Strong is big here. Cycling's big here. So this is what, if you're a baby, this is what cycling looks like for you. You should always be safe and wear your helmet. But there's all kinds of adaptive trikes. So next webinar, we're going to talk a little bit about funding and how you get those things funded um, because those fall outside of the, the norm. But I can generally find a trike or bike of some sort that my kids can use. And um, there's just a couple of more things I want to mention here. Um, Special Olympics um, 
all of our school districts that we work in participate in Special Olympics. I think it's one of the most fun things that our kids get to do um, throughout the year. Remember, Special Olympics can really lead to something as adults as well. Um, one of my little guys, um, well, he's not little, he was he was 30, but he actually tried out for the Paralympics in um, wheelchair soccer and um, made it to the final round and then got cut and didn't get to go to the Olympics. We were, we were really rooting for him. Um, so don't underestimate Special Olympics and the things that it can offer for the kids as training as they move up maybe into older sports. And don't forget to look for rec sports leagues like many of our communities have baseball, soccer, basketball, for children with disabilities, children in wheelchairs, all abilities. And I know our clinic um, sponsored a softball team every year um, in our community for children in wheelchairs, with autism, with all kinds of disabilities. So um, look for those things in your community, or of course, if you have time on your hands, you could always start your own league. Um, it is a lot of work. I'm not saying it's not a lot of work. We're almost done. This is the last thing I really want to talk about today is growth spurts. Because when you have a child who's got a movement disorder, whatever it is, growth spurts affect them tremendously. So the most common big ones occur between age two and three, around age seven, and then puberty. Now all kids grow at different rates and genetic disorders can impact growth as well. So having said that, not all kids grow tremendously like um, a typically developing kid, but this is typically when you will see growth spurts occur. What you'll probably notice when they grow a lot in a short period of time is they'll get a decrease in their skills because they get more unstable. So the way we grow is our bones grow first, right? We've got those growth plates, our bones grow, and then our muscles have to stretch and elongate over those bones. Those bones grow up and it changes our center of gravity. So the shorter I am, the lower my center of gravity, the more stable I'm gonna be. The taller I am, the harder it is for me to balance. So that is why tall kids often look a lot more uncoordinated and clumsy as opposed to short little compact kids. Um, you'll notice in um, typical development, often your little short compact kids walk earlier than your really tall elongated kids. You'll get a decrease in balance and coordination and you'll really notice this in your ataxic population. Their coordination really gets thrown off every time their center of gravity changes. This is often when we get our skeletal problems um, because again, with those hypertonic kids, those kids whose muscles are too tight, when those bones grow, their muscles don't stretch and elongate the same way. And so this is often when we'll get hip dislocations, joint contractures, um, and scoliosis become prevalent during this time. And this is often when they go in and say, mm, we're going to need to do some tendon lengthenings, often behind the knees and, uh, and again down at the ankle, because those are the joints that tend to get um, the tightest um, quicker. Scoliosis, you know, some, although we don't do it much anymore, brace kids with scoliosis, those things are very uncomfortable. Um, they put rods in kids' spines, you know, to help them straighten. So there's lots of surgical interventions that can happen as a result of those skeletal problems. My goal is, as a therapist, is for you not to have these problems happen, right? Like my goal is for you and your child to be able to manage these growth spurts as easily as possible without creating deformities and creating problems for you. And so I use a lot of positioning strategies that we're gonna talk about in our next webinar, which is why I'm segueing this in very cleverly, um, is that if you do good positioning and you do have great strategies in place, these growth spurts won't be so impactful for your kids. Um, and so this, oh, and I'm gonna be on time today. So I just wanna do a quick commercial for our March the 10th. We're gonna talk about adaptive equipment and I'm gonna talk a lot about funding and how you get it funded and how to navigate that world a little bit. And then I'm gonna do a case study 
and show you how you take a kid from point A to point B and how you show measurable progress with these kids who just make tiny, tiny, tiny changes, right? And how just a couple of key things can make all the difference in how they're able to access their environment and, and, and be able to move. So I hope you'll be able to join us um, for the next one as well. And so I'm gonna stop here and I'm gonna open it up for questions. I'm gonna stop my sharing here and see what we have. Yes. Okay, thank you so much, Teresa, for another incredible, informative webinar. Gosh, there's there was such terrific information in there. So um, let's see, I just want to, before I um, mention some of the questions, I just wanted to make a plug um, <clears throat> for one of our other par partner organizations, the National Ataxia Foundation, and their website is ataxia.org. And if you sign up for their information or their newsletter, they do have regular uh, yoga classes that they do on Zoom. And sometimes it's chair yoga. I mean, they do different things, but it's free and it's, uh, you, you know, you'll get a, you'll get a, um, uh, you know, an email about it. And so I recommend people sign up for that. So that's always great. Yeah. <laughs> and then the other thing I was going to say is there's an organization called iCanShine.org, which is uh, adaptive biking, swimming, and dancing. And I believe they're in like 35 states in Canada. And that's another great organization to, for people to look into. Um, so let's see, we have a couple of questions. Uh, Lynn had a really interesting question. She actually has two questions. Um, the first one, well, I'll, I'll, I'll pose both of them. I believe the first one, uh, Mandy will probably address. But um, so in this question, she says that her daughter has very poor poor oral motor skills. She can't blow out candles, blow bubbles, smile on, smile on command, control her tongue, et cetera. And so what type of therapy or therapist would be able to address those issues? So I'll let you touch on that. But the, but the other question that she asked, which I thought was really interesting, is if you can explain the difference between ataxia and dyspraxia. Okay. I might not be the best person to answer that question. Oh. Uh, <laughs> um, so to address the oral motor stuff, um, your occupational therapist and speech therapist are really the people who um, deal more with oral motor and language. So depending on what the overall needs of your child are, right, um, you can have both and they might be coming at it from a different a different side, right? Because you may have the OT who's doing more oral motor feeding and the speech person who's doing more oral motor language speech kinds of things, right? And so you often see that combination um, in, in, in my world, especially with kids who have multiple disabilities and really severe um, um, disabilities. I would say PTs are not the people who do oral motor stuff. I know enough to um, get you sucking a bottle good, you know, those kinds of things. But um, I leave the feeding to the feeding experts and the oral motor too. And Mandy will definitely talk a little bit about um, some of those kinds of things. And she's going to talk about... Um, how you do some low tech solutions for kids who maybe are not intelligible speakers, right? So she's going to talk a lot about how you build communication systems and devices for kids. So she'll touch on some of that. Um, dyspraxia falls more in that OT realm. <laughs> you know, it's not so much, it's not so much um, in my world. So there's dysarthria, dysgraphia, right? Like I can't write well or I can't speak well. So dyspraxia is more like a speech language kind of thing versus ataxia, which we talk more about when we talk about kids and they're walking, their big motor skills is more where you, you hear ataxia. So for instance, like people like that have Parkinson's disease, right? They have ataxia. And so you, you may see that, but they will also have the same language problems, feeding, swallowing problems, those kinds of things. And so they break it down into dyspraxia, dysarthria, dysgraphia, 
all the disses, right? Which just means I don't do that thing real well. Does that make sense? Maybe. Sure, thank you so much, appreciate it. Um, okay, so uh, another question is from um, Jeffrey uh, Gomez, who, who has a daughter with a KCNA2 gene mutation, and that is a voltage-gated potassium channel. Um, also loss and gain of function, just like CACNA1A. Um, and it's associated with mo multiple seizure types, intellectual delays, ataxia, coordination problems, speech difficulties, etc. cetera. So um, he mentioned that his daughter has epilepsy, ataxia, hypotonia. Um, and he said at the last webinar, you said that you prefer SMOs versus AFOs. But his understanding is that AFOs can help with clonus, but don't help with ataxia gait. So he was hoping you could touch on that. And then also, um, he also discussed some of the feeding problems, which I think you, Mandy will talk about. So yeah. stay tuned for Mandy's uh, talk. I th think she's she's on in April and in May. But if you could touch bait, to touch on again the AFOs versus right. the SMOs. Thank you. Okay. So what is an AFO versus an SMO, right? So an SMO is little short, like, I don't know if you remember the pictures that I showed you, right? But basically they just hug the ankle, right? And what they give is medial lateral stability in the ankle and they give a little bit of arch support, right? But they still allow that plantar flexion dorsiflexion, which is key to us being able to walk independently. If I put you in an AFO, even a hinged one, right? That, that supposedly bends at the ankle, it creates a lot of restriction. So it's basically like I'm casting their foot, right? So it depends on what I'm looking for. Am I looking for something that's gonna give external stability? And will that external stability create enough stability so that I can function? Or do I only need a little bit of stability and I can still function? right? So it's, it's every kid is a little bit different. So like for Caleb, he has spasticity, right? And so he's on his tiptoes. I have to give him an AFO and I'm going to give him an hinged AFO because I need his feet flat because walking on your tiptoes is really hard. But for kids with a taxi, it's a little bit different problem. And because their ataxia changes continuously, you have to be careful about over bracing kids. So what I often do is even if I give them an AFO, say I, I'm gonna, I'm like, mm, they really need that external stability all the way up their calf and they really need that much support in order to walk, I'll still have them 50% out of their brace. So I will often put kids in the braces part of the day and out of their braces part of the day so that they still are engaging those muscles in active ways because the brace, I don't, I, I mean, if I put my leg in a cast for six weeks, it's going to atrophy, right? I'm not using the muscles. My brain's not having to use those muscles to engage my balance system. So if I want a muscle to work, I've got to use it. And I've got to use it in the context of the function that I'm trying to achieve. So if I'm trying to, to learn to walk and I need a brace to walk, that's one thing, right? But can I back off of that? and engage my own muscles more and need less support. And we're gonna talk about support and stability a lot next time because that's what positioning is. It's figuring out what pieces and parts you need to provide enough stability, but not lock them in like they're a Robocop, right? Like you really want to allow the kids to have as much function as possible and provide as much stability as they need. So that is a good question for your therapist because I don't know your child and I haven't seen him walk. So I can't say, oh, I would put them in this or that, right? Um, every kid's their own unique little person, right? And so um, I go back and forth all the time myself. I, does that answer the question? I think that, I mean, that makes sense. And I know that every kid's going to be different. So we have to kind of have the assessment done in person with somebody. Right. Really yeah. touch, touch I can't, hands yeah. on your kid. No, um, Osmos is here, right? I know, right? If only. Um, well, there was another question that came in from um, Line, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, about whether it's possible that ataxia only appears when there are seizures. Is that something you've seen before? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, absolutely. 
Um, because, you know, what is a seizure? It's interrupting electrical activity in the brain, right? So it can be, whether it's affecting ion channels or whether it's affecting those neurotransmitter pathways, right? So you can definitely, that's why, you know, kids who have really severe seizures, you see like that trimmerine or that clonus or that tonic really appear when they're having the seizure because their brain is in a dysfunctional state at that point, right? And so it's not controlling movement. So absolutely, you can see things when kids are having seizures that you don't see when they're not. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and Karen asks, she says, my daughter has difficulty with so many areas that activity is limited because of dizziness and nausea. So she's in therapy. Um, she's ambulatory, but has difficulty, um, increased difficulty. So for instance, little balance to bike and difficulty with judging distance force. Uh, she's not um, sure if it's her CVI or difficulty with the place and space, but how do kids use walkers if they have that kind of difficulty? Like a walker or a gait trainer? I think either. This either. says walker, but I guess maybe okay. you can touch on both. Yeah, yeah. So you saw Caleb. I had him in a walker and I had him in a gait trainer because I want to give him something he can function in, right? So is the question more about does that cause her to be dizzy when she's moving? Like does movement cause her to be dizzy? I think it's that, you know, if they have those issues already, the movement causes some of those challenges. So can you safely be doing those? Yes. You know? Yeah. Okay. I definitely think so. And so we definitely see that with a lot of our kids, right? That if they get vertigo or they get dizzy or, and I think in our world, we haven't understood that really well. Like a lot of our kids have migraines too. And then all the things that come with migraines, auras and the nausea, the, the vomiting. And sometimes it matters what time of day we're doing things with kids too. And maybe if they're really nauseated and really having trouble moving that day, that's not a day we're going to get on a therapy ball and add to that, right? Because a lot of times those kids then just want to shut their eyes and, mm -hmm. and, and be like, oh my gosh, if anything moves, I'm going to vomit, right? So it's a balancing act. Um, and in many ways, that's even more challenging than kids who don't have nausea and vomiting with movement and dizziness because those we can work with those kids kind of all the time right and then those kids who have nausea and vomiting and dizziness it becomes um, critical that we sort of identify maybe the better times of their day to work and I do have kids that I know I have got to see them before noon because afternoon they are shot, they are tired, they are sleeping. It's a waste of anyone's time um, to do things with them. So like with our granddaughter, we know at four o'clock, she's gonna get an up gaze and she's gonna mm -hmm. get real attacked. We know that's not, that's the, her witching hour, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I think being aware of those times of day for your kids and those optimum times for learning is really important. Yeah. Yeah. And that changes a lot. I mean, for us, it used to be, you could never do anything in the morning and the patterns right. change. So it's exactly. observing that. Um, and Karen clarifies, show, how do they actually control the walker? Cause it seems like Kaylee, oh. her daughter might actually overshoot the walker or ball, so to speak. So I think it's. Okay. So is she holding on to a walker and controlling it? Let's see. Um, Kaylee, I can see if you, I mean, not Kaylee, Karen. I can, um, if you want to come on, um, I just unmuted you if you're able, if you want to okay. try to. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. It just seems like Kaylee would overdo things. Like, like I'm thinking even if she had a power wheelchair, she would probably run into walls as she doesn't know the space to stop. And I, is that part of all this? Like, I don't know if to blame that on her eye, her vision, or it's her force like she doesn't know where she's at in space it's probably a combination of all of those things so you said she has cvi right yes so a lot of times those kids don't judge that perception yeah so a wall coming at them means nothing right they don't yeah. know if it's 10 feet away or 20 feet away right <laughs> which is why the vision teachers tell you put contrasting colors up on the wall right? And, and do those kinds of things. Um, but it's also a function of their proprioceptive system too, 
not knowing how, where they are in place and space and when to stop because they, they don't really, they don't get that message, right? Mm -hmm. My brain's not informing my body. Oh, I need to slow down or, or, or stop here. Right. So right. it can be a combination of all those things. And then if they have ataxia, they don't decelerate well. So I spend a lot of time with like red light, green light, <laughs> you know, like I'll put them in their gate trainer and I make them, I'm like, okay, stop. Yeah. And then it's like five seconds later, they stop, right? It takes them that long to process it out and stop. Yes. Um, we spend a lot of time playing fun. Like I love my job because I get to play all day. And so um, I we play lots of games where we work on the problem. Okay. You know, what is the thing? I know with the Texas kids, deceleration, going backwards, those kinds of things are hard for them. So focusing on some of those things can be helpful. But talk to your VI teacher as well, um, because she may have some ideas about how to put things on your wall that help her um, know where something is. Well, is, will therapy help that or? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. You Thank can you. definitely make progress. Okay. Thank you. I, just, I just wanted to add one thing, Karen, because for example, my daughter went, I know you, you brought up the fact that sometimes she's really dizzy and nauseous. And yeah. um, with CACNA 1A, we have nystagmus. And I know in my own daughter, I can look at her eyes and I can see when the nystagmus is bad. You can literally see her eyes beating. And when that happens, she's dizzy and nauseous. And really the only thing that she can do is go to sleep and, and yes. get rid of it, you know? And so, but that's part of the episodic ataxia. And so you, so sometimes it's just, okay, take a nap, wake up and we'll start again. Of course, that doesn't help when you have PT at 12 o'clock and it's in the middle yeah. of PT, you know, but yeah. sometimes there's really nothing you can do, you know, right, Teresa? Do you find That's right. what causes that? The Excuse nystagmus me? to get worse at that time? I'm sorry, I don't understand. Say that one more time, I missed that. Is there any way to know what causes that at that time? No, or it's- what? Part of it's from it comes from the brain it comes from the cerebellum and there's really you have no control over it unfortunately and there are no medications for nystagmus so it's just something we're stuck with and we have to learn how to manage well do you see it getting worse it's not getting worse it's just um when it happens so it so cacna 1a is associated with different types of nystagmus downbeat nystagmus for example or up gaze so when you look down or up you often will see their eyes kind of like jiggle for a second Right. Um, my own daughter happens to have what they call rebound nystagmus, which is not in the literature, but that's what her neuro-ophthalmologist has, has diagnosed her with, because whenever she looks up, down, left, or right, and comes back to center, her eyes beat for a second. And so we're trying to work in PT, for example, on her, rather than using her eyes and her peripheral vision, because that only aggravates it, literally turning her body, you know, to look at something, so, okay. um, which, does, which does actually help. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And I think something else to do too is encourage these therapists to work together, right? So that you're not taking information from one and then taking information from the other and trying to mash it up yourself, have them talk to each other and work together to try to get a system for Kaylee that is going to work for her. Um, okay. Thank yeah. you. Of course. Yeah. So also I got, we had another question that came in, um, behind the scenes on, you know, I think a, a couple of parents would are listening in and thinking, oh my gosh, I wish you were a therapist and we don't have therapists who are this aggressive and care this much and are willing to work. Do you have um, feedback for parents who might be struggling to find a therapist who can really work with their kid? I mean, I know personally, we've had therapists who say, I don't know what to do anymore. I give up. Right. And like, where do we point those therapists or their resources? We say, well, check this out if they're willing. And then if they're not, you know, I, I'm assuming there's no good, like, um, you know. There's not a resource center of therapists. Yeah, right? like, these are the good ones. Um, yeah, um, I know. And that, that frustrates me a lot too, because I see it when kids come to me, like Caleb, for instance, he spent three years in ECI program where his PT did not do squat with him. He came to school and I was furious. Like I blew a gasket. 
I did. I was like, oh my God, right? Um, how could you do this little with this child, right? He could be, he could be, right? Um, how to find a good therapist is really hard um, because we're talking in a United States, right? Are all over, right? There's people here from Canada as well. I think you have to find your resources like where you can. I, I really think maybe one of the blessings of COVID is going to be that some of us therapists might be able to cross state lines. Um, you know, and not that not that I don't like seeing kids in person, but I have learned to do Zoom PT <laughs> and, and not so much like, oh, I can't be there to put my hands on you, but give you some ideas and some strategies about, okay, so these are some things you have, but maybe these are some things that you want to try or do, right? Um, I don't know what's going to be the future of therapy. I'm, I'm really hoping something good comes out of COVID. <laughs> and this might be one of those things where, because I'm not licensed to practice in whatever state, you know, you guys are in. Texas has a compact with 10 states, so I can practice in 10 different states because we have an agreement. But this is why I can't do therapy across state lines, right? We have to abide by our practice act. Um, but I would say shop around, ask people in your community if you are in a community where there are other children with disabilities, right? Not just even within your diagnosis, but ask. You know who often knows the really good therapists in the area are the special ed teachers. Because the, you know those kids go, when you're in ECI, if you really like your ECI therapist, I often refer my kids when they leave me in ECI, I refer them to a private therapy clinic where I want them to go, where I know they have good therapists. And um, I'm not really probably supposed to play favorites, but I want my kids selfishly to go on to someone that's going to do a good job with them. Um, we're lucky around Austin. We've got lots of clinics. So people can find a match. And we also have home-based um, ECI, like home health, like, like when you do an ECI, you can get home-based pediatric therapists. There are several agencies in Austin, which is, it does not exist in, in most of the world, right? Where people still come into your home and do therapy, even, and you don't have to go out um, to get private therapy. So I know in this area, you have some ability to do that. And I wish there were more of me. I'm looking for, I'm looking, I'm trying to train some more people because I'm going to retire. And so um, I really, I take students, I mentor them, I train them, I tutor them um, as a way of like passing along um, information. Um, but yeah, it's not the no easy answer to that. Yeah. <laughs> unfortunately, most of the PTs in the world do not go into pediatric. Or, or take the time and energy to learn more about how to work with some of these really complex kids. You know, I think and those are my favorite kids, actually. Like you're going to see in my next webinar, these are my guys, man. <laughs> I love equipment. I love adaptive equipment. I love, love, love complex kids um, because they're challenging, right? They're a puzzle and you've always got to figure it out. And, and that's fun. Um, I hope you'll think it's fun. <laughs> Go ahead, Lisa. I saw you come off. Did you want to do that last? Well, no, I was just going to say because we're running. It's getting late, but there oh, is yeah. one. What there's one last question that yeah. came in, so I thought maybe we should try to answer it. Okay. Which is, um, uh, this is um from Jeffrey again, and he said his daughter's base of support is wide, but her knees collapse all the time. So some doctors say it's she. Well, she has an ataxia diagnosis, but some is she. Uh, but uh, but some but sometimes the medical records will refer to an ataxic gait. So what is the difference or how do you differentiate between ataxia and an ataxic gait? So ataxic gait is just a way of describing what ataxic kids look like when they walk. Like therapists refer to, oh, they have a little um, spasticity walk or they have a little ataxic gait. So an ataxic gait, by definition, like if you were to say that to me, I would automatically think, wide base of support, knees collapsing in, hips a little internally rotated, arms up in high guard, walking like they're drunk. Like if you said a taxi gate to me, that is the picture I get in my head. So it's more of a descriptive term, right? They have a taxia, they have that gate pattern. Um, 
hypertonic kids have a pretty typical pattern. Even hypotonic kids can have a, a familiar gait pattern. I can go out on a playground of kids and I can tell you every kid on that playground who has hypotonia by how they walk and run. I don't, I don't have to touch them. I don't even have to be within 20 feet of them. I can just tell you by how they move. Um, so it's a descriptive term, not, um, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And um, quickly, do you know, any, have you heard about any outcomes with acetazolamide or Ampira? Who's asking also? I, I can answer that. Question. I was going to say, Lisa is the better person to answer that. So, um, so Ampira is, a, and sorry, I'm, there's a, I don't know if you hear the ambulance going, but there's um, a drug, it's called um, um, uh, for aminopyridine actually. And it's a drug that is used for ataxia. There is a lot of data on it. It is not, it is contraindicated if you have epilepsy. So it's the drug they actually give to the mice in the lab when they want a mouse to have a seizure. So, um, so that's the problem with that drug. And um, acetazolamide is, is really the only drug we have in our toolbox right now for ataxia. Um, and it is, it's, it's, it's Diamox. It's what you often, uh, it's, it's a glaucoma drug. It, um, it's often given if you go, I don't know, to a high altitude uh, to help your body adjust to the high altitude if you're going skiing or something. Um, but it is, um, it is prescribed for, for people with, um, with ataxia and it seems to, in our community anyway, it seems to work well. So um, I was going to ask Jeffrey if he'd like to reach out to me, Lisa at cacnoa.org. Um, I'd be happy to answer more questions about that. Yeah, wow, that's um, really informative. Thank you for sharing that, Lisa, because that's important to know. <laughs> um, so I think we're going to try to wrap it up here. It's been an incredible session. Um, thank you so much, Teresa, your wealth of knowledge, and we're so lucky to have you um, doing this with us. So we're grateful. I just wanted to quickly pull up that this was just number two in the series. So we've got the third on March 10th on adaptive equipment that Teresa was referring to that's coming up. And then webinars four and five will be with Mandy, who's a really um, skilled um, speech uh, therapist who will be helping us weigh in on kind of how to better engage our the communication skills of our children. Um, and then lastly on CDI. So um, you can just go to this bit.ly here, bit.ly slash deep webinars. Um, the W has to be capitalized to get there or just visit our, our website at deepconnections.net. And um, we are so excited for this series to keep rolling out. Um, there's so much incredible ground. We will have this webinar up on the website here at our uh, Deep Connections website and on the CAC and 1A website uh, within the next few days, uh, along with the slides that Teresa has. And we'll try to pull up, put up a bunch of those resources as well that, um, that came up throughout the webinar. So thank you everyone so much. Teresa, thank you. Thank you to Lisa and Sunitha. And we'll see you guys next month. Take care.